Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today we're joined by Anith Play, and we're going to be speaking about massive modifications of the corneal shape with orthokeratology on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you again for joining us today. We're with Anith Pillay, and we are excited to have you on the podcast. It has been something we've attempted to do, but with our busy schedules, we haven't been able to make it happen. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the Myopia podcast. Oh, the honor is all mine. I'm, I'm really excited to finally uh, get this going. Yes, yes. So, um, Anith, will you share a little bit about your practice, um, share with your entrance maybe into the myopia space um, and, uh, you know, the, the fellowship and your, you know, work with the academy and so forth, and just bring everybody up to speed with where you're at in the myopia space. You're a very prominent figure on social media, but people may not know the background. So if you could share a little bit about that. Sure. Well, uh, I work in a private practice called Evolution Eye Care, and we have two locations here in Houston, kind of the suburbs of Houston. Mm -hmm. We opened our first location in 2016, um, and we came in knowing that we want to do specialty services. Uh, myself, kind of focusing on anterior segment disease and myopia control, my partner, David Chow, doing vision therapy, low vision, and we both had a very strong interest in dry eye. And the interest into myopia control, like I said, started from the beginning, but with the academy, you know how it is. You just find one person, one mentor, and they just kind of drag you in. So I remember my first vision by design. It was uh, Dr. Monica Allison out of San Antonio, and I'm coming up to the booth, and she said, you're not an AOMC member yet? I was like, no, this is my first conference. Like, all right, well, you got to sign up right now. So I got peer pressured into that. <laughs> kind of like how it works with, uh, you know, with your state society, your local societies. And then from there, you know, just kind of go up and becoming a board member. And then they're saying, well, you got to get get your fellowship and just kind of just keep pushing you through. I, but I'm lucky to be part of such a great organization. But you know how it is. That That's how those kind of things work. Somebody just keeps keeps tugging at you and pulling at you and force you to do it. But I'm, I'm glad they did. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that I've uh, appreciated uh, about you is is your perspective in orthokeratology and so forth. And one of the things that I've observed and love is your beautiful ring of fire that you present on social media with regards to your orthokeratology fits. Um, of course, we 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 know they're probably not all a hundred percent like that, but you do seem to have this beautiful outcome, maybe a little bit more common than maybe some other people. And I want to attribute that to, if I may, uh, the fact that you use custom orthokeratology where you're designing your own lenses and so forth. Um, how did you get into the maybe the more advanced orthokeratology? What was your learning process and why did you go that direction? over maybe, you know, what maybe other people would use as maybe a standard order, maybe, uh, you know, a, a spherical design, um, maybe a ready-made or ready-to-order lens that, you know, involves less uh, less customization. How did, how did you move in that direction? Sure. Yeah, that didn't happen overnight. And uh, you're right. I post a lot of the good ones. I post a few of the complications, but they don't all look like that. Yeah. Um, but I would say it definitely ramped up once I started the custom designs and it wasn't an easy process. I would say for the first two to three years, I wasn't using custom designs. I was going through the gamut of everything that was out there. Um, anytime a new ortho K design came out, I always like to try it. And I, I use wave and eye space uh, predominantly mm -hmm. now, probably 99% of my designs are using those two platforms. And I remember it was probably three years ago when Wave first approached me. And I remember looking at what it would take to design an ortho K lens. And I said, this is crazy. This is going to take me forever. It's going to take me two hours where I just send information to my lab and they'll do it for me and they'll troubleshoot afterwards. I was like, I can't, I don't have time for this. You know, I got to go see other patients. Yeah. Uh, and then 
you know, after you know, going to Vision by Design and then kind of seeing other people's results, I thought, all right, if I'm going to be serious about it, let me get into the serious stuff. And from what I saw of the practitioners that do, you know, the high myopes, the crazy sills, the complicated cases, they were all doing custom software-based designs. And I thought, all right, if that's where I want to go, I got to really invest my time and my money to go into it. Because I will tell you, when I first started, there, there were a lot of remakes. There was a big learning curve. You know, I know Wave says and iSpace says, you know, 99 percent you'll get there. But to get started, you got to make sure you're OK with. All right. How do I learn how to design everything? So I had to be OK with that from the get go. I knew going into it, I'm doing this not as a profit margin center yet. This is for me to learn. And I was yeah. OK to do that for a year. I said, mm-hmm. I'm OK with saying every patient I see for the next year, it's okay if I don't make as much as I did on the other ones, but I want to make sure I get good where now subsequent years, I can get these complicated cases done in one or two lenses or less. Luckily, it didn't take a year to to learn it, but it it, it was steep. I would say probably three to six months, somewhere around there. Um, But there's no comparison. Once you start doing those custom software designs, I've never had um, any of the kind of the kind of, um, you know, the ones you sent to the labs, kind of those type of designs have the results, especially in the complicated cases like you do with uh, topography software-based designs. Yeah, no, I, you know, a- absolutely. I, I'm i curious what you consider to be a complicated case, right? So what you consider to be a complicated case may be a case that other people just haven't dealt with because they've just pushed those by the wayside. So maybe enlighten us into what a complicated case may be that you're willing to take on that maybe years ago you, you wouldn't have taken on. Sure. Well, well, the other, on, but had a bad result. <laughs> right. Well, the other problem was, you know, we get a lot of referrals from other optometrists. So yeah, they're likely not going to be the minus two myopes, the minus four myopes. That's not what walks in right. through my door. My average ortho K case is probably over a minus four with about two diopters or so. Yep. That's probably my yep. average ortho K case. Um, the highest that I probably have done in myopia is a, probably about a minus 12. And I've done about four diopters of cell. Mm-hmm. So that's that's complicated for sure. And when you and, do that, you get a perfect result every single time with perfect vision. And, <laughs> yeah. I wish. No, it's uh, you got to let the patients know, hey, you are not run of the mill. This is going to be complicated. You know, you got to expect there's going to be a lot of visits. We may not get perfect vision. So I let them know right up right up front. There's a reason you're here. It, don't expect to be 2020 necessarily. All right. Now I'm going to aim for it, but I don't let the patient kind of know that. So, you know, as the saying goes, um, you know, <laughs> just let set the bar a little low on their end, you know, yeah. under promise and over deliver. What does that so, look like specifically? Do you, uh, do you talk about a specific visual acuity, a specific visual outcome? Are you telling them you're you're going to have to wear glasses or likely still have to wear glasses? Like, what are some of those things that you bring up? Yeah. So for those high RX patients, I let them know you may have to wear glasses after. And vision correction is not my endpoint. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure you don't get worse. That's mm-hmm. all I care about right now. And if you have to wear glasses afterwards, That's kind of where we're at. Surprisingly, most of the patients that come in with those, uh, most of the parents that come in with kids with those high RX, they're okay with that. They're ecstatic that somebody would take the case, to be honest. So, you know, if their minus 10 kid is now wearing a minus one pair of glasses, they don't really care. Now, luckily, I haven't had a scenario yet, knock on wood, it's been several years. I haven't had a case yet where I've had to have a patient wear glasses. Um, for any residual correction with ortho K, even in those high RX patients I mentioned. Yeah. But it's important to say that up front because if you if you sell in the moon and then you you're under delivered, they're not going to be happy. 
especially yeah. with ortho k i mean they're, they're investing a lot of money not in the design but they're investing that into you mm -hmm. yeah i i i think i i know the reason why you are successful and the reason you are successful in myopia management is that you say vision correction is not my end point years ago uh, that seemed to be the driving factor of what we were doing in, in myopia management is vision correction. And I think that it turned for several of us to say, you know, the outcome that we're attempting to achieve may not be the most pristine vision. In fact, I think we'll get into a little bit later of how maybe worse vision may actually be better for myopia management, right? right. Um, I think that's a real, real key point. And I, I, I want to make sure I echo what you just said there. And that is a, a key component. Now, you mentioned that you're using both the WAVE and the iSpace system. So uh, is there a reason why you may be driven towards one or another one, or is it just the way the wind is blowing that day? That's one of the most common questions I get from my post. It's just how I feel that day. Like there you go. <laughs> today I want to try iSpace, today I want to try Wave. Yeah, I think they're I, both great platforms. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You might have a, uh, a Ford and a Chevy in your garage and you just want to drive one or the other, or maybe in your case, a Lamborghini and a, a Porsche, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So um, uh, great perspectives here. Now, um, you uh, you had uh, discussed a little bit about these higher corrections and some cylinder patients. What, uh, what goes into um, the design that is different when you're using a custom system versus what we would order for uh, a designing of a, 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 of, of a lens for somebody who you know, has a normal or an easier refraction. What are the things for people who haven't seen um, iSpace or Wave, what are you doing in those custom systems to modify the lens fit? Yeah, so I would say the first thing, especially with those higher sales, interpretation of the topography. That's so important. You know, is it is it apical astigmatism? Is it limbus to limbus? You know, what does the sag difference at an eight millimeter cord? I talk about that a lot when dis, um, deciding between toric designs versus non toric designs or free form, which is available with Wave. Uh, really good interpretation of what the topography looks like. So if your corneal sill doesn't match your refractive sill, there's different considerations. You know, it, it, you want to have a nice match. That, that makes for a much better outcome. If your refractive sill is much less than your corneal sill, that's completely different than if your refractive sill is much greater than your corneal sill. You know, you one's much more complicated. To correct all of it, right? You right? have to start inducing sill, and that's that's mm -hmm. no fun. Um, even I, I don't like to do that. So mm -hmm. you know, if you have less refractive sill than corneal sill, that's a little easier because you can kind of loosen up meridian. So I would say the biggest thing of jumping into custom software-based designs and going into those complicated cases, the biggest jump is analyzing your topography and realizing what's going on in that cornea, but also realizing the shortcomings of topography, right? Most of us use placido-based topography, which, which I use. I use a Menmont Meridia, great topographer, but it's still placido-based and nothing's perfect. So realizing what are the shortcomings and incorporating that when you're designing, realizing that, hey, you know, Ken Mahler said this to me. I, I visited him um, to, to kind of get him more and more and more into Wave. And he said, listen, every machine's going to lie. You just got to realize how much is each going to lie and how much you can, you know, incorporate your thinking to accommodate for that. And, and the more you see and spend time with someone, the more you can pick up when they're lying and not, right? And the closer you analyze topographies, the more often you're gonna realize where, hey, that that's not an accurate measurement. That That's an alternative one, that's a lie. And uh, so, you know, I typically think that if I'm, if I see uniformity of a, of a cornea that is toric and it's uniform, nasal, temporal, superior, inferior, and there seems to be this uniformity, I'm usually thinking in an elevation map of 30 microns-ish may or more may push me towards 
a toric design, what's going to do a freeform design, and what do you mean by freeform design? Great question. Um, so freeform means that every meridian is kind of independent of each other. So it's not toric. So that if you think of the cornea in every clock hour all the way around, and you can separate it into wave, I think it's like over a thousand, da- maybe even 2000 data points. So at 12 o'clock compared to one o'clock compared to two o'clock, I can have completely different uh, designs in the curvature. So when you get into custom software, you're not thinking about, um, I guess, curves as much as the tear film analysis. So those designs show tear film analysis more. So you can be very customized. And I, I have found that I'm using free form probably a little bit less. And that's because you're relying so much on that corneal data. It allows more air to come in. And I use what's called geometrically symmetric, mm-hmm. which is not exactly toric, but if you want to do an analogy, it's kind of close to it. And it allows for still really good results without having to rely so much on the topography data that comes in. And uh, that was also something that I, I learned from some of my mentors. Uh, Ken Mahler was mm-hmm. definitely one of them that that um, helped me kind of come to that conclusion. Because I did I did all free form initially, and there's nothing wrong with that. I know a lot of doctors that do great success with free form, but I've kind of switched my thinking into, let me get a good design as simplest as I can, and then go into the more complicated stuff if needed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just thinking if somebody has never looked at that wave system and is trying to follow what you're doing. So, um, you know, we're incorporating and we're importing a topography into this software. And then you select a lens design and you say, hey, I want an optic zone of such and such size. I want a diameter of such and such size. This is the refraction and so forth. And then the the system almost creates a little bit of a picture of what a fluorescing pattern might look like. And there's elevations for, you know, if there's a lot of fluorescing, there's going to be a, a large elevation and you can guide and direct how much elevation and how large a curve is. And that's really what you're doing with these systems. And speaking with Ken Maller, you know, when, when he first saw the first design of the wave software and how he had to completely figure it out, it's a a, a pretty great story. Um, But that's kind of what you're looking at and you're making these modifications. And I'm sure what you, you learned in this process was there was times where traditional orthokeratology fitting rules applied, but maybe with higher myopes, you needed to apply different rules because um, you needed to, you know, suck more tissue or it could compress more tissue in different ways. Likewise, in the in in the geosim type of systems, is there anything that you're like, okay, this is a high myope, I'm going to do this different, and that you kind of have as some of those rules that you've learned? Yeah. So, you know, for, for high myopes, you, you want to definitely get as much of the mid peripheral plus as you can. So you may have to, you know, shrink the optic zone diameter a little bit. Um, but that's more with traditional designs. I would say with these custom designs, they have such a ramping up or you can call it somewhat asphericity of how it goes from the central treatment zone into that next reverse curve that you get a lot of mid peripheral plus very quickly. So Mm -hmm. the traditional terms of optic zone relating to treatment zone don't exactly apply when you look at these tier from profiles. I will say when I first started to getting into custom designs, uh, the reason was I wanted to start doing more complicated cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then once I started doing it, I realized the benefit was not doing more complicated cases. The benefit was I understood how ortho K worked better. Here you go. Because when I when I was relying on the labs, a lot of them may not even give you all the parameters. You know, you send the data, they give you something back. It doesn't go right. You call the consultant. You say, what do I do? There's, there's a lot of reverse engineering that goes into it because they'll say, mm-hmm. okay, this is the next one. You have to figure out what they did. That's, mm-hmm. that's a good way to learn too. But when you have to design everything and you're left to your own devices, 
you start to study more, you start to learn more, you, you, you really have to know what's going on and you see the results of the modifications you make. So that's what I think was the biggest benefit is not just getting on more complicated cases. I had a better understanding of how ortho came. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just to, to hit on two points that you said there, number one is in these higher myope cases, I think people oftentimes think that the limitation of how much pressure and compression I can put, how much flattening I can have in that central cornea, you know, has a limitation. And, and really what I think we realize is that that, ha- that plays a part into it, but it's getting that plus in the periphery that really allows us to treat those high myopes um, and to be effective with them. And what you're trying to do is, is you're trying to do that, that, that squeeze force in the periphery, not just the compression force that most people may think of with orthokeratology in the central. It, 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 would you say it any different way? No, I think you're exactly right. I think when those high myopes come up, it's, it's the, it's that, that pull force. Yeah. In the mid periphery, that's yeah. what's most important. You want to suck that tissue out, not so much the push in the middle, but how much can I squeeze out of the central, yeah. Yeah. The central area? And that's why you're able to get those higher myopes. And then I think the other thing that you bring up is, um, you know, going to that next level of orthokeratology and understanding it at the uh, at the senior level, as opposed to a sophomore level of orthokeratology, when you're digging in, and you know, just it, it, this is a good opportunity to advocate for the academy and the process that it goes through, and going through a fellowship process with the academy, where you're having to get tested, and people are checking on your cases and your reports and so forth. And may I suppose that in the years that you were really digging in, that uh, accompanied your fellowship process? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think it's, that's always a goal that you have, but you, you never know. It is, it's not an easy fellowship to get. And yeah. I think that's uh, part of the the reason why you want to go after it. Anything that's worthwhile is not easy. So it was a, it was a goal I had for a while. And then um, I really kind of realized I wanted to do it probably in the last last two years, but it definitely makes you a better practitioner because along the process, you have experts that are reviewing your cases and saying, okay, why are you doing it this way? You know, why are you evaluating it this way? Well, you should think about this. And they, and they really push you. And it's not so much of just take a test and you get it, you know, pass, fail, pass, fail, you just keep going. No, there's somebody there that's that you're assigned to, basically a mentor that pulls you through the entire process to say, this is how you make your cases better. These are the cases we're looking for. This is how we should, you know, present it. This is how we should be troubleshooting, you know, really make you think about becoming a better doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, we both have been the last couple of years, I think I started uh, in on this and, and learning about it about two or three years ago. There's some papers that came out but maybe those beautiful uh, rings of fire might not be the target, and maybe the occasional decentered lens may be something that we don't necessarily want to fix. Why don't you share a little bit of this decentration and what we're kind of learning in that arena? Yeah, so this was actually at Vision by Design this last year. Uh, Pat Caroline and Randy uh, Kojima did a fantastic lecture on it. You know, I always love going to Vision by Design because I'll always have these incredible moments where I learn something. And uh, I remember I was sitting in the audience and my jaw literally dropped. I was like <laughs> like that for probably mm-hmm. 10, 15 minutes straight while they're talking about this. And it impacted my practice the next day, right, yeah. when I went back into clinic. So uh, basically, to kind of summarize, what they mentioned is these decentered treatment zones is not necessarily a bad thing. And the reason is, as you get that mid peripheral plus closer to the pupil, even if it's decentered, you might get higher amounts of plus compared to when it was perfectly centered, incorporating better myopia control. And not, not to get too much in the weeds here, because they, they had a fantastic lecture. I, I don't want to shortchange them, but we, we always thought you need that uniform peripheral plus. So it applies to the retina equally, but we're kind of going off according to their studies and their results, it was kind of off of false assumptions for 
of how myopia worked, not necessarily how the myopia control with peripheral defocus worked, just having higher plus work. So yeah, if I have something that's a little decentered and I'm having good visual outcome, no patient complaints, since that lecture, I don't change it anymore. Yeah. Uh, and that that's something I took day one from going from vision by design this past year. Um, now, again, any visual complaints, things like that, I'm going to obviously address it. But you know, I, I'm definitely less, less nitpicky of having a perfectly centered uh, bullseye ring as long as I have good visual correction. And if I go on my topography and I see I have really good peripheral plus, even if it's decentered, I'm going to let it go. Yeah. You know, one of the, uh, the the Volt study came out uh, and talked about those smaller treatment zones, maybe having a, a better plus in the periphery effect, and that's going to induce more spherical aberration. We've known for years, in fact, a, a project that I did during my residency back in 2004-05 was the observation of the higher order aberrations that we were inducing with orthokeratology is like, this is something that's happening and uh, that's the reason why we go to larger treatment zones is because we reduce those uh, aberrations. And, uh, you know, the Volt study pointed to that and higher orders. And then Jason Lau published a paper, I think I'm saying his, his last name correctly, uh, a paper in February of 2020. I wonder what we were all doing right after that. And wow, that's not like at forefront nothing, of our mind. Nothing big. Yeah. yeah in in the, the, the study was published, higher order aberration and axial elongation in myopic children treated with orthokeratology. And I'll just read a subsection here. The data was from 103 subjects, so it was pretty large. They were talking about the RMS or the root mean square values of total ocular higher order aberrations, third to sixth, right? Remember, um, for those of us listening, that that the the lower order aberrations are, you know, the 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 sphere and the and the sill. And then these higher amount of uh, aberrations, spe specifically spherical and chromatic aberrations or coma, increased by three, nine, and two times respectively after two years of ortho K treatment. So it's showing that yes, we increase the higher aberrations, but for individuals where their uh, Zernike term coefficients, a higher level of positive spherical aberration was associated with longer axial length and the slower axial elongation after adjusting for the baseline higher order aberration. So it's showing that those people that had higher amounts had a slower elongation of their eyes. And that's just to the point that you were speaking of is that the patients who come into the office and I see them in their 2025 and maybe even 2030 and the kid is as happy as a clam and the parent is like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And then I see a decentered lens a little bit, you know, and I'm, I'm effectively inducing coma by a decentered lens. Uh, historically, I would be like, this is horrible. We've got to refit the lens. You know, we're going to do a washout. We're going to, that's not the right thing to do. It's really telling us that even in kids who may say, hey, you know, my vision's a little blurry at night, but I'm, you know, functioning. Maybe we can give them some glasses or something. But sure. that very thing is likely what's helping to slow the progression down. Now, I don't know that we're going to get to the point, and, and, and maybe we are. I, I don't know what your perspective is, but maybe we are. But right now, we're not at the point where we're purposely targeting this. But if right. it happens, we're right. okay with it. But it may get to the point where we know so much about this that we design lenses that are just a little off center, right? Just a little decentered, yeah. causing a little. I will say I'm not smart enough to say that I'm confident enough to do that yet. Yeah, if it happens, I'm okay with it, but I won't design it for that specific reason. Well, we well, used to not be able to handle a minus 12, and now you can for <laughs> after the soda. I think if you tried to be center a lens with a little bit, of, you'd figure it out. Um, really interesting stuff. I think that the greatest thing that I can take away and that I've learned from people like you is that we can manipulate and modify the cornea in pretty amazing ways. It's an incredible structure. Uh, you know, it's, it's anti, it's abilities to fight off infection, it's ability to do all these things. And yet we can mold, modify, 
and make it what we want it to be with orthokeratology. And how cool is that, right? I, I mean, it's it's the reason to get up and go to work. It's awesome, right? I mean, there's nothing better than seeing that patient that's one of those, especially with those complicated cases, they come in and they're not wearing glasses for the first time in their life. And the parents' faces and the kids' faces, it's, it's, uh, it's really rewarding for sure. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Any closing remarks uh, before we go? Yeah. So, you know, I obviously want to give a shout out to AOMC. You know, a lot of what I learned, if not all that I've learned has been from doctors from AOMC. So I highly encourage, if you have a passion for myopia control or orthokeratology, please join AOMC. Uh, it is the organization to learn everything myopia control and orthokeratology. And then our annual conference, Vision by Design, is where we learned this stuff about decentration where, where Dave was there. So uh, it's a great conference to learn about kind of the latest and greatest in myopia control. And you know, last but not least, just, just get involved with myopia control. You know, the biggest thing, you know, I mentioned this before we got on is my, my biggest issue is not um, getting ortho K patients in the door. My biggest issue is for parents saying, why haven't I heard about this before? Mm -hmm. So the more of us that get involved, the better for all of us. And I want to thank you for uh, allowing me to get on your platform and, and do your podcast. It was really a pleasure. And you got my little Houston Rockets in the background. Not our <laughs> best year, uh, but, you know, I, I'll still have to rep. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you, man. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor to have you on the podcast. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes of the Myopia Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.